historic day. Five years ago today, the Dow and the S&P hit all-time closing highs. A financial crisis and European debt debacle later. Stocks are not that far away from those historic levels. Ends with disappointment. Apple's been the, the must-own stock for many of these money managers, and now that it's starting to go the other way, um, it may confuse the October 31st the year end. And Alcoa kicking off earnings may put another dent in confidence. I know at times I've cursed at the prospect of a stumbling Alcoa kicking off earnings season with a miserable first quarter. The number of times this company seems to miss estimates is balanced. The tone it creates makes people cringe. Your full earnings playbook plus Mark Faber on Fast Money right now. Live from the NASDAQ market site in New York City's Times Square, I'm Melissa Lee. An unhappy anniversary for the Bulls today, but earnings from Yum and Alcoa coming in better than expected. Our concerns about earnings and global growth here overblown. Should we just be happy, happy, BK, because the first two earnings out of the gate seem to be good? Well, I, I certainly think the one thing that's not priced into this market is better earnings and a better economic environment. That's for sure. I mean, everybody that you talk to is doom and gloom uh, around. And the economic numbers have not been that great. Um, so certainly some of it's justified. But today was a very interesting day because the whole rally from the 2009 lows up till now has been driven by this push and pull between policy and economics and or fundamentals. And today we had both a policy response in China and economic fundamentals with, I, with the IMF cutting the growth forecast. And today the market for the first time in a long time chose economic fundamentals, which to me is a warning sign. I mean, I know we're down quite a bit from the peaks here, so it's certainly not a place that you want to go all in short, but it's a, it's a warning sign that happened today in a very interesting day. You know, but you, you were actually a big, uh, and I'm not calling you out on this because you were right, you were bullish from the 1400 level all the way up to 1474. So you're turning back now saying lock in some profits? Well, well, I would say absolutely lock in some profits. And I think you need to you need to watch for the risk that the market has changed its stripes a little bit. Like I said, I'm not all in turning bears. How, how about this? Really quick, just to get yes. the trade right out of the blocks. What about a, a CLF? What about a name like that? Where so much of the conversation has been about iron ore. Now, if you look at iron ore, iron ore prices seem to have bottomed, but CLF hasn't reacted to that yet. It seems like you still have time. Uh, I'd much rather be in the natural gas space, and we'll probably talk about that later. I think there's That's been a structural. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's been a structural shift in in the coal area where China's just not going to need as much as they used to. So I just think there's better investment. Did you there. catch me rolling my eyes at your yeah. joke, by yeah. the way? Yeah. <laughs> I get a rim shot. shot. I, I rolled. Um, but by the way, let's talk about Alcoa just a touch because they were saying that overcapacity, not slack demand, is behind the lower aluminum prices. They did say a slowdown in China, but in large part, Alcoa came in just fine, a beat on the top and the bottom line. They're they're standing by their uh, estimates and they're standing by their growth uh, for aluminum demand, saying that it will double between 2010 and 2020. Let's talk about a long-term long yeah. forecast there. Well, I mean, Alcoa doesn't really have a lot of credibility on the long-term forecasting side. I don't think earnings season really starts until Jamie Dimon starts it on Friday. So uh -huh. we're going to get through what Alcoa does and it's going to go up, down, and all around. But I think the bigger issue here is the same issue we had in October of 2007, which is you have the confluence of growth slowing and earnings slowing at the same time, and you can't just sit there and be complacent and say fundamentals don't matter. They come home to roost when that company has to report the number, and I think it's going to be very much a stock-picking environment uh, from here on in. But in terms of the guidance that they're giving at this point, the China slowdown, yeah, we knew about that. What Yum is also saying about China confirms this notion that there is some sort of a slowdown. The fact that U.S. same-source sales growth in the U.S. is now the same as China really speaks to the slowdown in China as opposed to gangbusters growth here in the U.S. I mean, it is China that is slowing. We're getting two data points tonight from it. So. What can we what, glean? Well, he, I got distracted when he said Jamie Dimon. That's but true. I know, you know, well, that'll be an interesting earnings report. But, you know, Yum, as I said yesterday, I sold it too early. I think that the story is still generally intact. It's not surprising that it's slowing a little, but I think the stock also reflects a pretty intact story at 20 times. So even with OK earnings, I'm not about to jump in here. I don't feel like there's that much upside, and there is downside. Look at the size of the relief, though. We take a look at shares of Alcoa and Yum Brands in the after hours session on these earnings beats of BK, and, and this sort of tells you about what the markets were, were setting up for. They were setting up for the worst. I mean, they really didn't Absolutely. have any expectation when it came to Alcoa or Yum Brands because of the 
China slowdown. Yeah, the bar, the bar is very low going into this earnings season. So you definitely have that risk that you have people short and you could get kind of a, a rip your face off rally. I don't know if it happens, but certainly I know that markets tend to go in the directions that, that hurts the most people. And it, you never get hit by that bust that you see. It's always the one you don't see. And it can work both ways. Let's just go both ways on this. Edward Life Sciences today came out and they said, hey, look, we got to report earnings. The stock's down 21 percent today. So again, the market does punish the most amount of people at the most inopportune time. But again, I think you got to go both ways. And that might sound a little odd for a hockey player, but I'll stick with it. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, on the options desk, in terms of the move that we're seeing, the size of the move in Alcoa and or Young Brands, uh, did the options market predict it? Well, the options market for Alcoa, well, first, of, the first thing I would say about the options mm. market was it was pretty pessimistic on both names. Mm. What we were seeing was the most active strike for both was the first out of the money put in both cases. And we saw above average volumes, about three and a half times for Alcoa, nine times in the case of Yum. You know, so there's definitely some skepticism there. There wasn't a whole lot priced in because Alcoa, frankly, doesn't do a whole heck of a lot on earnings. I think that even when the news is good, it's still basically absorbed as mediocre. And take a look at the price action of the stock. Hasn't moved that much. It was forecasting about a 5% move. So I think basically the size of the move was in line. The sentiment was bearish. The sentiment actually going into most of the earnings that I see coming out in the near term seems to be fairly bearish, actually. All right. Speaking of bearish, let's bring in Mark Faber, the editor of the Gloom, Boom, and Doom Report. He joins us now on the fast line market is always a pleasure to speak with you it's my pleasure and for our viewers out there who didn't catch your last cnbc interview during that interview you said that i just want to have a lot of cash because i think that within the next six to nine months we can buy just about anything twenty percent lower than it is now do you feel the same way correct yes you do so you're just sitting yes. with piles of cash all around you waiting for the opportunity waiting for twenty percent lower from here yes yes all right. And so when you take a look around the globe, where do you think you'll see that opportunity? Well, what are you keeping on your radar at this point? Well, actually, I don't think uh, there is a hurry to buy anything. But if I had to really choose something, I might go for a rebound in Chinese stocks because the Chinese will also print money after the government changes and you could easily get the 20, 30 percent rebound. I personally, I don't particularly like Chinese companies. I would rather play it through the Hong Kong market. But basically, I think that uh, QE3, which is unlimited, and uh, the bond purchases by the ECD and the bailouts of countries has been largely discounted by the market. And the market has been weakening technically. So I believe that we may have here quite a serious setback. Uh, Mr. Faber, it's Karen. Let me ask you something. Is there anything that would change your mind, any kind of policy change? Or does the down 20 percent, would that be a catalyst for you to use some of that cash you stockpiling? Actually, I'm just rereading Milton Friedman's works. And I just don't understand that people like yourself can all the time point out to policies that will save the system. We need less policies and not more policies. No, and that's my we question. Need a Is there some government? Is there some policy that maybe would be a retraction of QE3 or yes. all of them? I would love to see everywhere in the world, certainly in the Western world, government expenditures and government bureaucrats being cut by minimum 50%. That would turn me very bullish. <laughs> Mark, okay. I am right and there I with you. I want to tell you something. Since we are on the anniversary of the high in... Uh, October 2007, I'm actually surprised that the Dow is still at 13,473, which is almost the same level as we were in 2007. Because if I look at the presidential candidates today, if Obama gets re-elected, I think the Dow Jones should be minus 13,473. <laughs> 
That's and if, if Romney gets elected, it should be minus 6,000. Wow. Well, well, Mark, so Mark you're also uh, anniversarying a call that made you really a legend in this business, which is October of 1987. A lot of people like to say the market's up year to date. Now, as you know, October 1987 was not a friendly time. Do you see anything underneath the hood from a technical perspective that concerns you on that basis? Yes. I mean, the previous... Uh, person you interviewed said that everybody is pessimistic, but that's not what I see in the marketplace. In fact, there has been over the last two years a rush into all kinds of assets, whether it's high-yielding bonds, government bonds, art, uh, high-end properties, the Mayfair property market or, say, the Park Avenue property market, and equities. And I think that uh, the asset prices are actually quite vulnerable, in my view. Hey, Mark, Brian Kelly, I remember sometime in the last 90 days, you had mentioned that for the first time in a while, you had bought European stocks. And I remember it because I was long European right. stocks as well. Are you still long European stocks? And if not, where would you get back into them? Uh, I'm still long because I didn't buy all that many. But I don't buy them now. I think the lows that we've seen four months ago will be retested. Maybe we'll not go down below those lows. You see, I just mentioned that the Dow was almost at the previous peak. If you look on the other hand at, say, the Eurostock 50 index, at the high in 2007, it was at 4,512. It's now 2,472. In other words, it's cut by almost half. The Nikkei is cut by half. The Chinese stock market is down 70% from the 2007 high. So I think there are some opportunities that are emerging, but I don't think there's a great hurry to get into them. All right, Mark, we're going to leave it there. Always a pleasure to speak with you. Mark well, thank Bob, you very much. Editor That's of Gloom, fine. Boom, and Doom Report. Uh, these days, more gloom and doom than boom. Um, but we do want to point out a headline that you may have noticed at the bottom of your screen earlier. Chevron, we were watching those shares tick lower. Chevron is warning in the after hours session. Upstream and downstream revenue will be, low, be, will be below the prior quarter, the second quarter. Chevron sees Q3 downstream results significantly lower than Q2. And uh, again, we are seeing the shares down about 1.5% in the after-hours session.